OK, welcome everybody to this writing cultures seminar. Uh, I'm going to start by introducing our speaker for today and then, uh, and then I'll pass over the time to him. So a uh, Trey Ventor Griffiths is a practitioner academic working as a public historian as well as an artist and public sociologist. His writing has been published in poetry, journalism and nonfiction, and he's worked with organisations in the arts, education, third sector and on projects linked to race and disability. Much of his work also intersects with criminology, media and English literature, as well as film and television studies, including but not limited to race and racism in period dramas, as well as disability while black. His session today is titled Why Are Period Dramas So White? Without further ado, I shall shut up and pass over to Trey. The floor is yours. can see your screen, but we can't hear anything. Is that right? Yeah, I think you're on mute, Trey. And then we go. Are we, are we good now? Yeah, we can hear you now. OK, <clears throat> so um, Welcome to today's session. So, why is period drama so white? And I just want to thank, say thanks to um, Writing Cultures for allowing me the space to speak. Uh, my name is Trey, and I'm a PhD student um, here at Kingston um, in creative writing um, under Sarah Upstone, doing a project on Northamptonshire, Northamptonshire's post-war Caribbean um, migration story. So, the story of the Windrush in Northamptonshire in the UK. Uh, but nearly all of my work is also intersectional across criminology, media, English, and, and other disciplines. Um, my interests are in neuro-minoritized disability, uh, but also whiteness in provincial settings, so in more towns and country spaces, as well as British film and TV, which today's talk um, more focuses on. Um, so <clears throat> why are period dramas so white? I've been thinking a lot about this recently, um, and it started with Britain's obsession with World War films, um, Tudor dramas, and those set in the 19th century. Um, so much so that myself and my friends and colleagues, um, Amanda A. Prescott, Carrie Sinanan, and Bianca Hernandez Knight all published essays in 2021 um, with the American journal ABO about race and racism in the Jane Austen fandom. Um, and when it comes to race and period dramas, we are often blocked from these discussions in fandom as a form of tone policing where the admins of these online communities seek to maintain knowledge production in white, within white British history. In 2021, with our other friend as well, Adrienne, uh, we, further did, we further did a panel discussion on racism in the Jane Austen fandom at Virtual Jane Con, which normally happens in New York every year. <clears throat> Um, but it went online um, due to COVID. It's about two hours and it was recorded, so I can share the link with that to that as well at the end of this talk. Uh, but today I'm going to talk a bit about whiteness, a bit about black history and a bit about fandom. So I'll situate my positioning within the black-white binary, uh, black British history uh, within a white supremacist media culture. However, whilst everything I say can also be applied to in different ways to non-black racially minoritized groups. I wrote this lecture inspired from my experiences of anti-blackness within the period drama fandom and the numbers of ways these white spaces police black fans from talking about black history. I also speak from the perspective of an older sibling. Um, I have a teenage brother who's 14 who wants to go into this, into the acting industry. And he's going into an industry where certain kinds of roles will be denied him based on the color of his skin. Uh, this is not me trying to be macabre, but really asserting a fact uh, that even though the arts is wrapped in this sort of liberal identity of um, progressiveness and forward thinkingness, it is also entrenched in whiteness, privilege, um, racism and exclusion that Professor Shannon Sullivan further talks about in her 2014 book, Good White People, as well. <clears throat> 
living in Britain, uh, a country that uh, where period dramas continue to be a functioning part of British culture overseas, from the Romans to the Regency to the adoration of the war, to the more uncritical biopics about Churchill, why shouldn't black actors audition for these roles? Uh, black people have been present at some of the most pivotal moments of British history, yet are often excluded from the casting process. More and more black British creatives are going to Hollywood for work, while our own industry continues to exclude them. Regarding period drama specifically, there was slow progress. Many of you watching will have seen the backlash to the Netflix adaptation um, of Jane Austen's Persuasion, but may not have been aware of the amount of racist infighting in response to the casting of black and brown actors in that film. Uh, furthermore, this was also precedented uh, by what was now by what has now been donned as hashtag Pineapplegate in relation to the Sanderton fandom in 2019 following the release of the Andrew Davies adaptation of Jane Austen's um, unfinished novel, Sanderton. My friend and colleague Amanda Ray Prescott wrote a paper on this called Notes on a Scandal, which charts the role of social media in a violent racist discourse around Sanderton. Prior to 2019, uh, in 2017, um, the STARS program Outlander, based on the long-running sci-fi historical fiction series by Diana Gabaldon, received in-fandom backlash when, in season three, the showrunners decided to tackle American enslavement by showing the investment of Scottish, Scottish enslavers in the American South. This was compounded by the resurgence of a, of a conversation around Irish, and I put this in quotes, white slavery, on social media as a way to say, what about white people? In order to detract from the discussions around anti-blackness within American enslavement. As far back as 2015, there was also racism in the Poldark fandom, um, the BBC series based on Winston Graham's book series, which in my opinion improves upon the books, uh, being a bit more inclusive where they cast black British actor, Kerry McLean as Kitty Despard in season five. And this provoked um, racist backlash under the guise of arguments of historical accuracy. Kitty Despard was a real historical figure and my friend Amanda was actually kicked out of um, many period drama Facebook groups for supporting the Poldark showrunner Debbie Horsfield for including actual British history that wasn't included in the original source material by Winston Graham. It's not canon was an excuse um, racists used to shut down black Poldark fans from supporting um, her as well. <clears throat> uh, this is underpinned by a particularly fervent culture war led by the political right that seeks to keep British history as white and most certainly pervades the education sector, the reclaiming of ideals of white supremacy related to the British Empire, the adulation of Churchill as a war hero and the worship of the crown, all at the expense of whitewashing history. Through period dramas, the makers do have the power to challenge the, challenge the conservatives anti equality charade by making shows that reflect the society of the day. Within period drama discourse, which is also predominated by cisgender white women, many black fans are policed from talking about black history. In many cases, I can point to racism on, on, uh, of white women on my own persons, where the term Karening is aptly appropriate. The fan base continues to be a magnet for self-serving white feminists. As Von Ware shows in her book, Beyond the Pale, white women are not on the fringes to histories of racism, but central to its maintenance. So this is some of the context perspective creatives must be aware of as far as period dramas in terms of fandom, but also in the industry. But the history books tell a different story to our screens. To many, especially those looking at Britain from the outside, the whiteness of British period dramas, whiteness in this case meaning stories told exclusively through a white European framing, is what British history may look like. Yet this does not reflect the black presence within our history books. Some of these screen media texts have the occasional token appearance of a black character, while others do feature these characters uh, more prominently with their own storylines, but most still don't even do that. So for simplicity, I'll be referring to period dramas as films or TV programs that tell a story specific to an era. And I'll mainly be talking about before the 1960s. Um, though this genre encapsulates many 
stories, even up to the 1980s with Russell T. Davis's It's a Sin. All history is shaped by those privileged to tell it. Period dramas and historical novels continue uh, to combine facts with fiction and do have the potential to move the conversation, where in my opinion, uh, things that are too factual do not always make good TV. Some historians will tell you that period dramas are not historically accurate, um, but when we know that history is written by the fictors, um, it's history for history's sake, accurate. In the UK, the victor's narrative has often favoured white men, as period dramas have long been challenged for being whitewashed as well. In, 2021, in a 2021 article um, by Kirsty Grant, um, educator Akala tells us that most of the period drama we, we get is usually focused on elites, kings and queens and great men, so to speak. He believes that the lack, that the lack of black people in period drama is a deliberately manufactured ignorance. His novel Dark Lady aims to introduce people to a picture of Tudor England that is not well known. Um, and this is Shakespeare's time where you would have seen black people in society roaming the streets. Movements to decolonize curriculums and education due to whitewashing and so on are worsened by the ongoing culture warriors who claim British history isn't for black people because there were apparently no black people in Britain back then in these time periods. In a 2017 article for the Herald Scotland, uh, writer Julian Fellow said he is in favour of more diversity in casting, but not necessarily in period dramas. According to him, these texts put you in a different time frame or different territory, as he says, and you can't make something untruthful. And he was saying this in reference to his musical Sixpence. But since 2017, he has since backtracked on this because I'm sure he, he, found, he soon found that he was talking nonsense. Historian Jeffrey Green's book, Black Edwardians, uh, discusses a different reality. He, he says that numerous places had a black presence, even in the early 1900s. Such places were situated across the breadth of the UK, very much a black British history encompassing England, Wales, Scotland and Ireland. Jeffrey Green further tells us that Edwardian Britain's widespread population of African birth or descent was resident at the centre of the world's largest empire, some knew no, other, knew no other land and others were self-motivated migrants. They were ambitious professionals, youths anxious for the education, um, parents concerned about their future, adults seeking, more, seeking tranquility and workers seeking more money, as well as the descendants of earlier generations, as is shown through the um, city of Liverpool, for example, which has had a pop black population since the 17th century. Um, Research conducted by the BFI, uh, the British Film Institute, saw that nearly 60% of UK films between 2006 and 2016 featured no black actors in a named role. They also found 13% of UK films featured a black actor in a leading role, and 50% of those parts were found in only 47 films, which is less than 5% of the films they looked at. In their research, the BFI looked at nearly 1,200 films, um, the way many period dramas are written erases black people out of these histories and this country was built on. Black Britain needs a historical context and as far as black actors in film and TV, let alone period dramas, the career of David Oyelowo, for example, is someone I have uh, followed quite closely for a while and I've enjoyed due to the diversity of roles he sustains. A 2015 article for the Radio Times, Oyelowo describes the lack of period dramas featuring black people. He says, we make period dramas in, in Britain, but there are almost never black people in them, even though we've been on these shores for hundreds of years. I remember taking a historical role with a black actor at its centre to a British executive with green light power. And what he, they said was that if it's not Jane Austen or Dickens, the audience don't understand. And I thought, OK, you're stopping people from having a context with their country that they live in and you are marginalising me. I can't live with that. So I've got to get out. There's a string of black British actors passing through where I live now in L.A. We, we don't have Downton Abbey or Call the Midwife or Peaky Blinders or the 50th iteration of Pride and Prejudice. We're not in those. And it's frustrating because it doesn't have to be that way. I shouldn't have to feel that I have to have I shouldn't have to feel like I have to move to America to have a notable career. And many more uh, black British actors have moved to the States since he did that article um, in 2015 as well. Um, 
period dramas are politically powerful uh, and send messages. The messaging in whitewashing British text is pushing the white beliefs, the white culture, the white values, much in the much through media representation of history in the same language that that Lord Macpherson used the term canteen culture for pushing for a culture of policing in the 90s, pushing cultural power, where the job of media theorists is to expose that agenda and critique it. Uh, sociologist and cultural theorist Stuart Hall um, spent his career analysing how mainstream media represents race, gender, class, culture and religion, but even at the nucleus of mass media there was something called ideology, and Hall didn't believe the masses were passive, docile consumers. In fact, he interrogated who the so-called masses were. As some media critics said that power is imposed from above, Hall believed that there were pockets of resistance that undermined dominant narratives. In this scenario, consider people like Amanda, Kerry, Bianca and Adrienne, who have carved out spaces to discuss racism and black and brown histories in period drama fandom. Stuart Hall took this further and told us to look for stories elsewhere in spaces that the ivory towers um, or the establishment would look down upon. Consider Twitter, TikTok, for example, period drama fan fiction. Um, so formalized spaces that host official histories and narratives are a well-oiled machine, and there are people who are pushing against that. David Oyelowo's points hold sway within a culture, uh, within culture as a source to dominate a people. So the word hegemony uh, reportedly comes from the classical Greek word um, hegemon, which was used to mean uh, what was usually a city state, which held political and military control over others. But in recent times, however, it has developed to imply control outside of the physical. It is really thanks to theorists like Antonio Gramsci that this gained popularity, and he used it to analyze the ruling class and how they came to rule in a capitalist system. One of his key findings was to see that power is not only physical, but cultural. In short, then, to give an example, the reasons why dominant film and TV distributors, irrespective of growing black characters in their shows, push a white-centric narrative, is to reinforce an institutional perspective that serves the political interests of corporations in the sense of keeping British history as white. An all-white world of lords and ladies is legitimized and constructed as the norm. A common sense worldview that any reasonable person, and I say reasonable in air quotes, that should have, whilst also presenting anybody that challenges that status quo as nonsensical. So here we can observe that power can be enforced as much through physical domination, i.e. through military and policing and so on, as it can be through art. At its core, hegemony is that power is not just exercised through physical violence, but through cultural violence, like storytelling and images and so on. So to this day, I despair, uh, dispel the myth that black people only started coming to Britain in 1948 with the Windrush, namely because black people have been written out of Britain's history and such narratives are so absent on not just school curriculums, but also in many universities. In 2016, the Daily Mail was quietly outraged at the notion of a new GCSC history course and textbook making the case to Britain's GCSE students that Africans were in Britain before the ancestors of the English. And this is a computer generated image of Cheddar Man, whose remains were found in Cheddar Gorge in Somerset um, in 1903, reportedly dated to have existed 8,000 years before the Romans arrived. News reports revisited this story in 2018 to be met with hostility from what would from those that would seek to keep public perceptions of Britain's history as white. We only look at how the government handles uh, conversations around decolonial curriculums and how some universities continue to refuse to act. We might conclude that our educational institutions are also part of the problem. Um, in the introduction of Black British history, historian Hakim Adi writes about how African Romans have been an open secret for many years and he also discusses that Africans were in Britain before the Angles, the Saxons and the Jutes. Furthermore, that Africans reached Britain perhaps a thousand years before the Romans. Um, the evidence here is archaeological, like tooth enamel, um, oxygen isotope analysis. So what that means is archaeologists did tests on remains, so teeth, and know what these people consumed, including findings 
um, finding the geographical source of water consumed by an individual when they were children. So when we think about this in relation to physical archaeological finds like stone tombs, for example, this presents questions about Africans in Britain. So when it comes to period dramas set in Roman times, um, featuring black characters, I have seen few. Uh, HBO series Spartacus comes to mind, featuring two uh, black actors. Yet when I think about other shows like Rome, Britannia and Empire, they are relatively white. Despite histories where we know the Roman Empire spanned from Rome to North Africa uh, to the North African provinces. Considering other shows like ITV's Plebs and films going back to the Golden Age, Black people are manifestly absent. So you can see there is a trend. Roman history is multiracial and multicultural, but the cast of many of these films and TV shows, not all of them, are white. Uh, in, this, um, in the series Alison Hammond Back to School, we are further told about an African emperor called Septimius Severus, born in what is now today modern day Libya, but he died um, in England, in York. He came to Britain in 208 AD following a message from the governor of London. And one of the first things he does um, when he gets here is oversee the construction of the walls of London. So the city of London is defined by an African Roman emperor. Septimius Severus was not the only African Roman we know of. Quintus Lollius Urbicus, who came from what is now Algeria, was governor of Britain from the year 139 to 142 and supervised the building of the Antonine Wall in Scotland. Furthermore, we also know of a woman called Ivory Bangled Lady, who was a middle class African Roman woman living in 4th century York. And further, further to that, uh, Leach and colleagues tell us that she was a mixed race woman in touch with Africa, Christianity, Rome and Yorkshire. Um, up in South Shields, there was a stone tomb of an African Roman called Victor, and that's the picture there. And findings on the chalk, chalk downs in Eastbourne also speak of an Afro Roman known as Beachy Head Woman, who lived um, who lived on the south coast, and that's that's a reconstruction of her, what she may have looked like there as well. Um, meanwhile, in Cumbria, we know that there was an Afro military unit nearby to the village now known as Rough by Sands. There's a document called the Natitia Dignitatum, an official listing of all ancient Roman civil and military posts. It makes mention of a unit called Numerus Memorum Aurelia Nor Norum. And this was a unit of Aurelian Moors and, and it was formed in the area Algeria and Morocco are today. There were, they were named that because they were Moors from North Africa with the likelihood being that they were brown or black. So these excuses as to why our period dramas remain white by producers and the suits and the moustaches within the British arts establishment are pretty baseless. Starting with the Romans, you cannot tell me why these shows remain white other than an ideology uh, um, within media that is rooted in white supremacy. The fact uh, there was probably the fact there probably were women that looked like me and my friends and members of my family should be in these in these films and it's with sociologists historians etc cetera, etc cetera, uh, that are also multidisciplinary artists we may be able to blow the recruiting system wide open challenging the production and the how people are recruited into the into the audition process as well the history is there simply uh, those with green light power in media have to see the value in black history or be encouraged to see the value. For those of us who were educated in the UK, uh, there are probably uh, a few of us who went through the British school system without learning about Henry VIII and the Tudors as well. Yet much like the Roman era, there were black people here too. Uh, the most famous of them, some of you may have heard of, is the Tudor trumpeter, uh, John Blank, who was in the courts of Henry VIII and Henry VII before him. Um, the late historian Imtiaz Habib tells us that John Blank's assimilation into English society was marked by his marriage in 1512, which was recorded in the Exchequer account of Henry VIII, whom he married and what happened to his family is not archivally visible, and that he himself is visible, luckily for him, literally in a painting, which is one, which, which is one of the few historical images of early modern English black people to have survived, is the accident of the lavishness of the royal occasion which enveloped him. Um, what that means is, is that the anticipated birth 
of a child as an heir to the Tudor dynasty is what spotlights him as an otherwise invisibilized figure, a black trumpeter used to play at the event. Habib goes on to discuss how this is an example of an event required an unveiled identity of black people in the early modern English archives, when names like John Blank will reveal very little about their, their black heritage and really would pass for white. The image of John Blank in the manuscript um, known as the Westminster Tournament Roll is one of the few identifiable portraits of an African Tudor, an African in Tudor England, showing that Africans were present from the earliest years of the 16th century. Um, the Tudor histories I learned within the confines of a school classroom were whitewashed, focusing on um, England's relationship with other European powers, especially France and Spain. And the existence of John Blank makes me question how the, how the Tudor history I was taught was through a white gaze and why this history has not made it onto our TV screens. As a springboard, which should motivate you to do your own research, the 2019 series, The Spanish Princess, is worth watching. Um, and it storifies the early reign of Queen Catherine of Aragon, played by Charlotte Hope. And it co-stars Stephanie Levy-John as a character called Lena and as her companion and servant. Lena is a black woman and is not enslaved, but an employed member of the royal staff. Reading into that character more deeply in Black Lives in the English Archives, Imtiaz Habib refers to a woman called Catalina, who says who he says was a blackamoor, while in his while in his series Black and British, I've forgotten history, David Orlasoga also refers to someone called Catalina as a lady of the bedchamber. This show also includes Ovido, played by another black actor, um, Aaron, Aaron Cobham. And the on-screen relationship between Avido and Nina is also an example of black love in a historical drama. And black people unapologetically in love it, on screen is not common on UK TV, let alone a period drama. This series is an adaptation of The King's Curse and The Constant Princess by Philippa Gregory. Yes, this series does stretch the limits of believability um, and it does take creative license with historical accuracy. But what it does do is write black people into a Tudor drama in recurring roles, um, and they're not enslaved. And John Blank also appears as well. Lately, books like, like Black Tudors uh, by a white historian, um, Miranda Kaufman, have brought a spotlight to African Tudors in popular and public memory. However, Kaufman builds on the work done by black scholars like Onyeka Nubia, as well as the original archival research, which was done by people like Peter Fryer. Um, in Tias Habib and David Dabi Dean, as well as in the 1970s following Shylon, scholarship on African Tudors is testament to the white privilege that exists in academia, where the work of black and brown scholars has largely been overshadowed by white people. That is not to invalidate the work of white scholars, but to show how whiteness pervades academic spaces, where the due credit is often denied black and brown academics in the white academy even considering scholars of empire, so many experts are white. For example, the National Trust's audit into uh, empire and stately homes um, done by Professor Corian Fowler and colleagues in 2020 was largely done by white academics, whilst those living in the trauma of that history, even intergenerationally, are not part of that process. But before the Spanish princess, I had not seen any black actors in text set in this period. Um, I'm going back to things like Elizabeth and Elizabeth the Golden Age with Kate Blanchett, as well as more recent stuff like the Tudors. Um, in 2015, um, Wolf Hall, uh, the BBC delivered Wolf Hall, starring Mark Violence as Thomas Cromwell, adapted from the novel by the late historical fiction author Hilary Mantel. All of these lack in black characters, despite evidence histories of Africans in, in Tudor England. And aside from that, not all of these Africans were in the courts. Many were ordinary people, many were working class as well. Historian Onyeka Nubia's work is incredibly useful in really showing Black Tudor society, beginning with his book, Black Amours, and then his, his book, England's Other Countrymen, while contributing, contributing a chapter in Hakim Aidi's book, Black British History, New Perspectives, on if African Tudors, in fact, got to name themselves in relation to the society around them really interrupting and disrupting modern conceptualizations and formations of, of blackness. 
Um, so, so did African Tudors in Tudor England name themselves Black and Moors in relation to the whiter society around them? It's basically what he's saying. The Tudor period spanned from the late 1400s to the early 1600s, and Black people were part of this story. The way the Tudors are depicted on screen needs to change, but many are still clinging on to the histories they were taught at school, and that reflects the whiteness of period dramas on screen. Uh, Peter Fryer also goes on to write that a small group of Africans was attached to the court of King James IV of Scotland, um, experiencing what was a benevolent form, a, being called a benevolent form of black slavery that had become common and fashionable during the preceding 200 years. The 2018 film Mary Queen of Scots, starring Shasha Ronan and Margot Robbie, uh, faced racist backlash when they cast Adrian Nestor and Gemma Chan in named roles. The inclusion of, inclusion of black and brown actors in, the late, in a late Tudor drama rubbed many people the wrong way, um, especially in many of the period drama fandom groups. These circles frequently are exhibitions of racism when black and brown people are included into historical spaces we have, we have been conceptually excluded from. Simply the arrival of the Windrush in 48 acts as a cutoff point of what is acceptable for us to occupy space dictated by these fans. Some of these groups even ban people for talking about race in period dramas, a valid topic of discussions. Season one of ITV Sanderton was interesting due to the much of the story centering around a black woman um, and, and race. The fact it was a Jane Austen story that followed a Caribbean heiress did upset the racist apple cart and it follows Crystal Clark as Georgiana Lamb in a seaside town set to and set to inherit a hundred thousand pounds, which is millions in today's money. Her mother was enslaved. Her father was the enslaver. She is in this society ultimately navigating the whiteness of Regency culture. So while stories revolving around colonialism are challenged uh, because they do not always show us in most flattering of roles and are can be traumatic, these are programs. There are programs set in these years that cast black characters as leads and co-leads as well. In the wake of the many trauma narratives through slave trade films, I can see a sort of renaissance in a period, in a period drama slowly. Films like Belle and United Kingdom by Amara Sante had to, be, had to get made to make it more acceptable to get things like Sanditon, which then made it a bit easier to get Netflix's Bridgerton, a diverse persuasion adaptation, and my new favorite, film, the 2022 film, Mr. Malcolm's List. Um, this film follow, is, a, is a Jane Austen adjacent story that follows Mr. Jeremy, Mal Jeremy Malcolm, who is in search of a wife. However, he has a list of qualities that he has, that he is measuring all, all, of, all, of, his, all of his suitors against to avoid, for lack of a better term, gold diggers. He has this list of qualifications and I will not say anything more on it other than white characters in this story are the minority in named roles. So if you did not like how Bridgerton dealt with diversity, I would recommend you go and watch Mr. Malcolm's List. But when you start to look at period drama landscape more widely, you will find that the genre is starting to take more risks, bending traditions. Here I come to think uh, about, about series in the past like Black Sails by Stars. Um, recently as well, Hulu's Harlots, as well as the BBC's Peaky Blinders, which was marketed as crime, not period drama, which deserves another conversation about marketing. In Doctor Who, Sarah Powell also played Mary Seacole. In Britain, Black people are in historical periods is celebrated um, as a new thing when it is really not. Britain has, a long, has long been a multiracial society shown in our history books, but not on our TV screens. The promotion of British culture as, a, as white has been so successful uh, due to a myth-making of period dramas, empire nostalgia, World War II biopics, and so on, um, long for past time. And if you want to reinforce Britain's history as white and maintain the fantasy, film and TV is a good place to do it. As in 2020, disgraced actor Lawrence Fox was criticized when he claimed that it was odd that there were Sikh soldiers um, in Sam Mendes's film, 1917. What he didn't know, what many people um, still seem to um, not know, is due to how the war is taught and talked about in this country, is that over 4 million uh, black and brown non-British people fought in the First World War. Over 130,000 of them were Sikhs, 
making up as much as 20% of the Indian army. So when it comes to World War I dramas, I think most recently about the brilliant drama Journey's End, but really most of these stories centre white British men, not, not the world or the, or the world war that we talk about. But there are other stories about the war that we need to discuss. Um, in 1918, for example, there was a mutiny at Toronto in Italy. The British West Indies Regiment battalions mutinied against the white institution of the British Army. Um, and speaking in a BBC short film, um, historian Professor Oliver Ocelli tells us that while the white soldiers were celebrating victory, the black soldiers were ordered to do the laundry and clean the toilets. When the rest of the army was, gave, was given a pay bonus, the black soldiers did not. They were outraged and they mutinied. And that lasted four days. They refused to work and violence occurred. Um, so in any strike, there are always demands from employers and employed employers and employees. And current the current UCU strikes at universities are a good example. But at the time, the War Office dismissed the demands of black soldiers and implemented the Marine Corps to confront them. Sixty soldiers were tried, some were imprisoned, and one met death by firing squad. Black soldiers that fought in World War One were, were were treated as second class citizens. Despite over 1 million black people taking part in the First World War, they were also excluded from the victory parades happening in London in the summer of 1919. Black participation, colonial racism and colonialism has largely been erased from the national consciousness of the wartime narratives in both the First World War and the Second World War. Many within the political elite had an investment in the empire project and that meant maintaining white supremacy. Racist stereotyping occurred in both the British and the German camps. Uh, stereotyping on the British side included policy making and the like to subjugate black soldiers. On the German side, they used it to attack the British and French governments for allowing black soldiers to fight. The pamphlet entitled The Employment Contrary to International Law of Coloured Troops Upon the European Theatre of War by England and France, as quite a title, uh, published by the German office. German Foreign Office in 1915 is a good example. And this document states that British and French colonial soldiers conducted horrific acts of savagery, like amputating the body parts of German POWs. So it was basically just propaganda. This is not exclusive to Germany and similar racist thinking also happened in Britain, like uh, the journalist E.D. Morel, um, who, who became a Labour MP, writing that France was thrusting her black savages still further into the heart of Germany, and he was writing in 1920 in response to the French occupation of the Rhineland. Um, white supremacy pervaded through wartime policy making um, and the World War. Um, Emma de Brury further states by giving black and brown people the opportunity to fight to kill white men, they were in the eyes of racial theorists disrupting the world order. And Oliver Ocelli further makes clear that the war office question the quality and the ability of specifically West Indian men as well. The government were worried about damaging decades of white racial prestige. So really I'm asking the question of by, by what rights are black actors and brown actors as well being denied from these dramas. It appears to me the film and TV industry are operating a slick machine that seems to, that seeks to keep period dramas as white in spite of a history where black and brown people have been in, been in Britain and part of Britain's history for many, many centuries. Whilst period dramas have been criticised for being too white, this does include depictions of Britain as early as the last century with both world wars. Historians like Phil Vasili, who has done a lot of work bringing uh, these stories and histories to the public, as he has done with the story of Walter Tull, who is pictured here. Um, the end of the First World War was also uh, also saw many black people come back to Britain after the fighting was finished, both those who were from here and those that came here from the colonies. In 1919, with job tensions uh, rising, there were racial riots across the country and the trade unions, particularly the Siemens unions, gave white men jobs ahead of equally qualified black and brown sailors. Yet these riots occurred in as many as nine seaports like Liverpool, Glasgow and Cardiff. In the wake of the armistice signing, racial riots were occurred between January and August 1919. And whilst Britain had also been hit hard economically, you'd think rioting would have been dramatized to our screens in, in the interwar years. 
public discussions of black white race relations in the 20th century have scarcely begun to analyze um, a pre Windrush narrative. World War II, however, is a period British film and TV are obsessed with, but do not represent properly. It's a world war, but lots of these texts, everybody is white, often male and British. Yet BBC Two's um, show World on Fire, I found really compelling for the fact that it had black actors, uh, black characters, sorry, um, gay characters, disabled characters, women with agency, as well as showing institutional wrongdoings. We know more will watch feature films and TV dramas than documentaries. So we, we need to do better on this in terms of our programs. Morgan Matthews' sequel to The Railway Children, named The Railway Children Return, also took inspiration from the Battle of Bamba Bridge in 1943 um, to construct a fictional racial riot in the village of Oakworth in Yorkshire. Um, other racial riots during the war occurred in Launceston in Cornwall and Cosham just outside of Portsmouth and uh, Bamber Bridge is a village just outside of Preston in Lancashire. There are black histories of World War II that could be told on screen no less than what happened in Britain but the industry continues to dominate with the story of white British men out in France and Belgium um, fighting, fighting the enemy essentially when there are other stories we could tell within Britain that also include black and brown people as well. With the arrival of 240,000 black American GIs as well, between 1942 and 1945, there were actually more black people here in Britain than there were in 1948 with, with the arrival of the Windrush. In fact, if creatives want to take that story further, they could take the story of Gabe and the characters in the Railway Children Return um, to the story of Britain's brown babies. Um, the estimated and the estimated 2,000 mixed race children that were born from the unions of black American GIs and local white women. Lucy Bland's book is a brilliant source on this and I write about this further from a film and TV perspective um, and history perspective in my article the, on the Railway Children Return um, which I can link in the chat at the end as well. The role of period dramas has untapped potential Historical fiction, films and TV have long meshed sci-fi and fantasy with history for entertainment. Uh, dating back to the mid noughties there have been many episodes of Doctor Who who, who have acted as what journalist Amanda, Amanda Ray Prescott calls mini period dramas. Particularly, I have fond memories of Christopher Eccleston era when he pays Charles Dickens a visit at Christmas as the undead come to life. In the era of Tennant, David Tennant, the Doctor and Rose go to Scotland in 1879 and come face to face with Queen Victoria and, and a killer werewolf. And in the era of Martha Jones, Doctor and Martha meet William Shakespeare and Martha is worried that she'll be cast off as a slave um, in the 16th century. She would be, um, she would not be wrong in thinking that because in 1562 as well, this was when Britain or England um, entered into the slave trade with the partnership between Elizabeth I and um, a pirate named John Hawkins as well. As New Who continues to present the everlasting need for genre bending tropes, the place for black and black actors in period drama is not just about period dramas, but our right to be heard on television and in film and so on. More recently, Mary Seacole was played by Sarah Powell um, in the last season doing battle with the Sontarans. Doctor Who has always been an escape for me, but also a site of questioning the whitewashing of Britain's history. The Jodie Whittaker era especially has tried to do inclusion work and has often met criticism for doing so. Uh, my favourite episodes have been the period drama ones, especially where we had the Doctor and crew on a mission with Rosa Parks, further to the demons of the Punjab, where they went to India during partition, which revolved around Yasmin Khan's family history. Um, also the, the Villa Diodati, where they were stuck in a house with Lord Byron, Mary Shelley and Percy Shelley. Further to the two-part thriller Spyfall, following, following Noor Inayat Khan, whose code name is Madeline, and she was a real historical figure, and she was a British Muslim resistance agent during the Second World War, and the first woman wireless operator to be sent in, from Britain into occupied France in that period. So the war years were home to many black people and brown people in Britain, including afterwards with the Windrush generation, as shown um, in Call the Midwife as well, starting in the 50s. Personally, I believe some of the most 
critical questions being asked on television are in period dramas. Uh, my own personal favourite at the moment is called The Midwives, adapted by Heidi Thomas. And the early series were based on memoirs by Jennifer Worth on her experiences as a midwife in Poplar in the East End of London in the 50s. But after series four, it goes off book. And the show has taken the chance to centre historically the historically excluded voices, what, others, what other shows do not. They have told stories about black and brown people, traveller pe traveler communities, disabled people, domestic abuse survivors, rape survivors, poverty, same-sex relationships, um, transracial adoption, abortion, and the discussions around it, including its, decrim its decriminalization um, at the end of the 60s. Um, with midwifery, health and community at the nucleus, Call the Midwife shows us that through, depiction, through its depictions of inequality, um, almost anybody can fall into the abyss that comes with institutionalized and structural violence. If you have not seen it but want to, I'll just avoid the trailers and just start watching it from episode one. On, it's all, all of it is on BBC iPlayer. Um, and it's one, of the most, it's one of the most conservatively, but also radical shows I've seen on, on TV. Each episode is punctuated by childbirth with the same attention that shows like Peaky Blinders are punctuated by, by violence and things like that. Here, I find many men actually have written it off uh, as just a woman's show when Call the Midwife, in my opinion, may actually be a blueprint for depicting inequality on television that is as personal as it is questioning of our structures and our institutions. It is deeply political and it is a quiet activism that isn't marching with placards, but it is pro-choice, anti-racist and somewhat anti-capitalist. And there's a side point, and that's a side point to its depictions of the Windrush generation as well. Um, that discusses misogynoir in a UK context with the introduction of Lucy Anderson uh, pictured here. Um, probably the first black nurse depicted in a British period drama as well. Uh, this comes conjoined to people like Una Marson, so that's Una Marson here, who has been largely forgotten as the first black woman producer at the BBC, working with household names like George Orwell um, and T.S. Eliot. She was born in Jamaica, and she came to Britain before the Windrush in 1932, uh, giving platforms to many black artists, intellectuals and others. And this is part of a history of the BBC. And now I'll, I'll re I really want a feature film of, about her life as well. So in closing, the place of black people in UK period dramas uh, has long been framed as something that starts with the Windrush, yet we have been on these shores for at least 2000 years, probably more. Our influence on Britain's history has been great. And to me, this takes me, this takes the position of what um, in the Jamaican community we call Talawa, um, which means um, small, but strong. The positionality I speak from is one of a black British male, but someone that is also Caribbean and black people have been coming to these, this nation since the third century with the Afro-Romans and Britain is a nation of many peoples by nature and those casting directors and people that organise the auditions and so on for these period dramas using the excuses of historic accuracy to cast all white casts are frankly talking nonsense because the history is very much an opposite to what they're doing. To me, Black British history means everything, and to live in Britain today means you are part of Britain's national story and have been a beneficiary of how Black people shaped our history. And it is impossible to deny how Black people have moved that cultural needle now. The children of Britain, Africa and the Caribbean, with recent histories of innovation with, with my generation, going back to the clips of artists of the 40s and 50s, like Lord Kitchener, that came on the Windrush, back to the artists that were in the courts of, Henry, of, of um, James IV, Henry VII and Henry VIII, to the Roman camps in Cumbria, where Afro-Romans would have sung African songs and told African stories. So uh, we Black people need to be in, the fr in front of and also behind the camera and also part of the decision-making processes um, because this is, this is British history is our history as well. And we've been here for for millennia and more, enriching this country beyond all measure. Um, and that's the end of my talk. And this pic, this slide here is basically just a, 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 a vague timeline of the black presence um, in the, in Britain. Um, and that's the recorded presence. I'm sure if you went before Romans, you'd, you'd find something else as well. So yeah, um, 
but yeah thank you for listening and if there's time I'll, if anyone's got questions i'm happy to take any questions fantastic thank yeah. you very much um, and yeah we'll open the floor to yeah. questions you can put your hand up you can unmic and speak you can write something in the chat um people a second to gather their thoughts yeah daisy do you have a question hi oh wow that was so interesting i'm so glad that i checked my email and saw this was happening today because i just found that really really current, really relevant, really important. Um, so I, I work as an extra, I work as a supporting artist. And what's really interesting is that um, you would like the one of the last points you made about kind of in front of the camera and behind the camera is that over the last few years, we've seen more and more black um, supporting artists being hired. Yet the makeup and hair departments, the costume departments, perhaps the props departments have not had their chance to catch up on their mm. side with supporting. So there's some great quote about how equality is inviting people to the party, but inclusion is actually asking mm. them to dance. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so this, it's been a very slow, slow movement. And every supporting artist on set has some horror story about how their hair, they, there, was, there was not the right products for their hair. So anyway, the idea is that the industry can change itself to try and mm. write new narratives about um, characters that were present in history. But then there's a whole bunch of other infrastructure that also has to change at the time, which is quite frustrating. But uh, a third AD told me about two years ago that apparently Netflix has some new policy about their recruitment numbers. So they're putting a lot of effort into trying to cast more people from diverse backgrounds. But um, that's a challenge in itself because if the industry is not inclusive enough, then why would people want to stay and why would they want to tell their family to be part of it? So I've got some good contacts for you if you want. I'm also a PhD student at Kingston. Like if you'd like to interview anyone, like any of the people who work on the hiring side, um, I don't know. Yeah, I'll mean, be interested. And I'm sure in my talk, I talked about Amanda as well. And Amanda, she works at Dead of Geek in America. Um, and she's interviewed like Reggie, page and from Bridgerton and that and she's always she's oh, always interested in people into it so if you tell me I'll, I'll, message you. I'll ask her as well yeah, <laughs> if she's interested um so oh, yeah thank you for that oh thank you no it's so interesting I followed you on Instagram so hopefully I keep up with what you're up to yeah <laughs> any other questions comments thoughts contributions couple of minutes left. I mean, I'd ask, what is your research topic? My research topic is not actually in period dramas. It is in, I'm doing a um, a history of Northamptonshire, but specifically um, the Caribbean migration story, um, because we've had Caribbean migrants here since at least the 1950s, um, including my, my great grandparents and my grandparents who came here at that time. So I'll be hopefully look going around the county interviewing um the elders but also their children as well um about what it was like in Northamptonshire from the 50s and the 60s and in even into the 70s as well so yeah that's basically what my project's all about amazing i have a a, a kind of quick question point i don't i don't really know um my research particularly looks at social media and how people communicate online so i was particularly interested that some of the kind of backlash and gatekeepings coming through the fandom routes mm -hmm. is that are you, are you able to say a little bit more about that or because also so those things are often seen as being these ultra liberal you know everybody can equally communicate online but clearly it's not not yeah. necessarily the case no it's it's what i would call um nice racism I think that's probably the term for it, um, especially in the groups. Many of the, so a lot of the white women dominated and I'm and United States based, and many of them are, are very much like the um, people that voted for Trump. So half of the white women that voted in the U.S. elections voted also voted for Trump. So then, what the reason we got Trump is that's actually white women's fault in the United States. Um, but the way they gatekeep in the fandom groups is 
through the rules sometimes. So they'll say no politics allowed. And then they'll say, oh, racism and miso misogyny and LGBT issues. Oh, that's, that's political, so you can't talk about that. But what if you're watching Gentleman Jack, which follows a, which follows a gay woman in, in the 18th century? So if you watch something like that, you can't talk about a significant part of the of the TV show, which is which is her identity as a gay woman in a time when it when it was very much um, stigmatized. Um, so yeah, that's how they that's how they gatekeep. That's when we'll, so you see the list of rules in these Facebook groups, and they'll say no politics, and politics is euphemistically done as no no discussions about racism or anything like that, so, and then they'll kick you out based on based on that thing, based on that. So yeah. That's how that's how they do it, and it's 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 so sneaky as well. So yeah, um, yeah, that's that's really interesting. Thank you. Any other questions or comments before we thank Trey? Oh, Emily, you put your hi, hi, hi Emily. <laughs> um, it was a really great lecture. It was really interesting. Um, I um I tuned in specifically because I'm in kind of the early research stages of. Um, writing a period drama based on the life of Louisa May Alcott um, and obviously she was a white woman um, yeah. living in America uh, in the 1800s um, but her family and her were very involved in the abolition movement and I, I really firmly believe that it's impossible to talk about American history without talking about race specifically because she lived during the civil war which was yeah. a war based on on race politics and slavery. Um, and I really want to explore uh, the, the black people she would have known and the black communities that she would have been uh, familiar with, but I also do not want it to come across in any way as like a kind of white saviorism mm. because mm. you know they were involved in the Underground Railroad, but I don't want that to be like a, yeah. this white family who were helping all these black people. I just wondered if mm. you had any advice sort of about where to look for um with that because my my expertise isn't american history mm -hmm. I, I would say there was a book called i think i've got let me give me that i'll see if i can find it oh, there's, there's this book have you seen this one can you see that yeah trouble with white women yeah and it takes it's a counter history of um feminism and, and it takes the history of feminism within a, within a US context. And um, the author, Kyla Sculler, pretty much juxtaposes the sort of the known feminists who were white against the black feminists who actually founded the movement. Um, and she does put that through a, um, a US slavery lens as well uh, within that. So I'll say, go and read this book and see what she writes. But also I would say there's another book called um, they, were, they Were Her Property. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's by a, an American historian called Stephanie E. Jones Rogers, and she basically she plots the history of white women as, as slave owners in the American South. In the American South, so I think when it comes to Louisa May Alcott's narrative, when you do go and write write it, yes, this white family did help, but also many white women specifically did own slaves in their own right, um, and the, the history of slavery is much longer than the history of abolition and I think that's what you should probably could focus on within that as well and that's equally applicable to the UK context because we love talking about Wilberforce in this country but not the 200 years of slavery that happened before that as well but um does that, uh, does that answer your question yes very helpful thank you I'll, I'll definitely get to reading those but thank you very much yeah. fantastic thank you so it, it's two o'clock and I think a few people all had uh, left it on the hour presumably to go to other meetings and things so I think it's time to wrap it up to thank Trey once again for your fascinating talk and for um, uh, the contributions to the discussion as well um, thank you very much take care and hope to see you next time when's the, when's the recording come when, when... oh hang on let me just stop the recording <laughs>